Now once again is that blessed time in our service where we take up God's word. Today, as if you've been following along, we are in Isaiah chapter 40. So turn there with me, and if you would, in reverence to the word of God, stand with me. Our intention today is to consider verse 40 through 26, I mean, verse, chapter 40, verse 18 through 26, but I'm going to read from the beginning of the chapter down through verse 26 and then pray. Listen and hear the word of the Lord. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord. Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says cry, And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. Go up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of Jerusalem. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of Jerusalem. Good news, lift up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense is with him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and he will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollows of his hand and marked out the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man has shown him counsel? Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, The nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? An idol? A craftsman casts it. A goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts it for its silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretch out like uh, the heavens, like curtains and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Who, speaking of God, brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of this earth as emptiness? Scarcely are they planted, scarcely are they sown. Has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble? To whom will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He brings out their hosts by number, calling them all by name by the greatness of his might and because he is strong in power not one is missing you may be seated and let us pray once again before we consider God's word together 
Lord God, as we turn our attention now to hear your word opened up for your people, God, we ask you once again that you would be pleased to move us in our hearts to truly draw near to you, that this would be a time of careful consideration that moves us to amazement and adoration where we genuinely worship you in the hearing of your word. God, we pray that as we hear these things that we would be moved within by your spirit to a sense of your glory, to a glimpse of your grandeur and greatness. Oh God, thank you for your word. Grant that I would speak it in such a way that it makes some of the things in this passage clear and that the hearts of your people are humbled and their eyes are lifted up and fixed upon you and that you would continue to stand as our, our salvation, our righteousness, our hope, indeed our everything, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. So this is the third time that we are taking up this section of Isaiah 40. And I reminded us in the very beginning of it, he had come in. The children of Israel had been told that they would be under a time of deep threat. A, a, a deep judgment was coming. But into that, God would come and he would bring comfort. And we saw that in those, that old covenant comfort of times of exile and times of restoration, all of those served in some way to kind of prepare and stir us up and point to a greater deliverance. And that is the salvation that would be coming in Christ. Indeed, as that passage goes on, it speaks and prophesies of John the Baptist who would come. And in speaking of him, it speaks of the one who would come after him, where in him we would behold the glory of the Lord. We were reminded last week that when you go up to the high mountain to say, this is the good news, this is the gospel, it is behold your God. And the difference between that and what goes on in the world today, the, uh, so often preachers tend to think, what is it that the people might want to hear? And then I will tell them, behold, here's the answer how to get it. Jesus. The scripture says, behold your God. And when we see God in all of his glory and all of his grandeur and all of his holiness, we understand what we truly need. We need pardon for our sin. We need forgiveness and restoration, and that is only in Christ Jesus. Now, after kind of unpacking all those things and speaking about the brevity of man and the extraordinary immensity of God, we now move on to the next section. And this next section really beginning in verse 18 through 26 that we're going to look at today, he kind of broadens it. He had been focusing in on Jerusalem, on the people of Israel. They understood or should have, at least from their heritage and history, who God is. But sadly, they live in the midst of a world around them that had no clue who God was. And tragically, from time to time, they would abandon him who was the true God who had mightily revealed himself from among them, among them, and they would follow after the false gods of the nations around them. And so I want us to begin to take this up today and do our best to understand it. Now, as I unpack this, I will say this in advance. This is not something that makes us feel great. When we hear this passage, it, it, it puts men lower and lower and lower it makes us think what is wrong with men and if that's what you begin to say it's because we've not yet really begun to consider the effects of sin that have come upon mankind in Adam and the broad scale impact of that now we oft don't see it because we don't live in a country where there are idols on every corner or idols in front of every home. Again, I mentioned having just come back from five weeks in India, idolatry is exceedingly vivid upon my mind. 
And it, it's indicative of things that really show us uh, men's blindness and hopelessness apart from the gospel and the divine revelation that opens their eyes and lets them know who is the true God and what is salvation. So I want to take this up, and it begins really with this, and hopefully you have your outline that we will follow. It says this, it begins with, the incomparability of God. I call this the glorious greatness of God. He is absolutely incomparable. Simplify the word incomparable. You cannot compare him with anything else. But then what do we do? Constantly compare him. And I've heard men, and they, this man attributes it to this quote to this man, and this one to this man. I have no idea how this particular quote began, but this is an observed reality. When God created the heaven and earth, it says, in his likeness created he them. Yes? And then many a theologians have said, and since that time, particularly since the fall, men have been creating God in their own likeness. And actually, that's a step farther. They're not just creating him in their likeness. They're creating him in the likeness of less than them sometimes. Animal forms and otherwise. Now, I want us to just consider it. It says in verse 18, To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? Now when that statement is read, the immediate response of anyone who has any idea of the true God should be what? No one. We will compare him with no one. There is no one that can compare with him. But then he knows even the Jews' tendency, he knows men's tendency, and he begins to show what I would indicate here in our outline is men's irrationality. We like to think of animals as irrational beasts, but brothers and sisters, we are not by nature any better. Listen to what it says in verse 19 and 20. An idol, a craftsman, casts it. Now, the reason why he's comparing it here to an idol is because in the idolatrous societies, they are saying, this is God, or this is a God. But an idol or a craftsman have cast it, a goldsmith overlays it with gold, casts silver for its change. Again, by the basic introduction there, do you know what you're seeing? That little God's very existence, everything about his appearance, everything about his adornment, all of that is made by men. I mean, how turned around is that? God is the one who has created the heavens and the earth and all that is in it, and then here are men in the midst of it who are going to make their own gods seems irrational it even says it begins to get a little bit mocking here it says he who is too impoverished to make a contribution uh, or whatever uh, for an offering chooses wood that will not rot the whole sense is this everything that the idol is made of who made that in the first place God did and then who then fashioned it men who were made by God And almost all the things men make, how long do they last? You know, even many of those things that were magnificent in the ancient days are but ruins now. People will travel the world to see beautiful ancient ruins. I mean, they're not what they once were, are they? And these things are temporary, and they rot, and the best things you're going to offer to them are temporary, and they rot. And then you seek out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. I mean, here you're hoping that this idol will move things for you. And yet it cannot even move itself. 
You know, and, and, and again, it's shocking to me uh, coming back in the particular taxi that I rode in in India, hanging from his windshield mirror was a little Hanuman, which is a, a monkey god. But I just thought this is so curious because this version is even scaled down, made out of plastic, you know, and, and with every turn of the car, it, it shakes uncontrollably, and it looks like a child's toy, and yet this is still viewed, up, viewed as a god. And that wasn't enough for the taxi man. He also put on the dash of his car a little god they call Ganesh, which has the body of a boy but the head of an elephant. And they stick it there with a sticker. And it just stays there on the dash. And in their imagination, this God is, in the, is the remover of obstacles. You know, and it, so it sits there on the dashboard, this little bitty plastic guy. And you think, do you really think that that's doing anything? Now, I'll even say this. Take that guy and turn, him, turn a whole mountain into an idol that's 200 feet high and 100 feet wide. Does it still do anything? Does it hear anything? Does it move anything? It does nothing. It's like it's so empty. Listen, as, as I want to just draw our attention to things from the scriptures and really seek to worship God in this. Psalm 115, verse 1 to 8 says these words. And this is not only, not only to false gods and idols that are the works of men's hands, but even to the men who have made them, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name gl give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. God's glory should not go to another. And then it says this in verse 2, Why should the nation say, Where is their God? Where can we go and have a look at their God? We can't see him. Uh, and here, you know, where's your temple? Where's your image? Where is it? The nation says, I can't see your God. I'll show you mine, this little blue fella. You know, or, or whatever it may be, they will show it. But where's your God? And here's the glorious answer of those who know the God of the Word. So Psalm 115, verse 4, or verse 2, or verse 3, yes. <laughs> it's in there. Our God is in heaven. He does all that He pleases. Amen. Your God that you made a mountain out of, He can't get out of the rain. He can't do anything. Our God is in heaven. He does as he pleases. Their idols, it says in verse 4, are silver and gold, the works of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak. They have eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear Noses, but do not smell. Hands, but do not feel. Feet, but do not walk. They do not make a sound in their throat. And those who make them become like them. And so are all who trust in them. Empty, vain, useless. Now, I think sometimes sitting on this side of the world, we think, oh, it's easy to uh, consider others as blind in these ways. But I want to take up a few more scriptures that, that show this idea. Isaiah 46, again, takes us in verse 5 to say these words. To whom will you liken me and make me equal? And compare me that we may be alike. God is incomparable and man's attempts are irrational. He says, As to whom will you compare me? And it speaks of those who again make their little idols. Verse 7 it says, They lift it to their shoulders and they carry it and they set it in its place and there it stands. It cannot move from its place. If one cries out to it, 
it does not answer, and it is not able to save him from trouble. Once when uh, Jemima and I were living in Nerul, uh, which is in, in Navi Mumbai, India, our next door neighbors, Jemima was interacting with one of our next door neighbors. And that particular region is exceedingly dusty. I can't express to you how dusty it is. I mean, it is the, the day after you have completely mopped, you can slip and fall. That much dust has already accumulated. And as Jemima was interacting with the lady next door, one of the things this lady was interacting with her about, they were talking both relocated to that area. But she was mentioning how often she has to clean her God. Because her God sits there on its little stoop and the dust falls on it, and it is not even able to keep itself clean. It needs those people that it's supposed to be looking after to look after it. Does something seem backwards there? And yet somehow the heart of mine does not see that something's gone backward there. And oh, that we would begin to understand it. But then this Isaiah passage turns from the irrationality of these animals that they, uh, or these, these idols that they carry on their shoulder. And it begins to say this in verse 8. Remember this. Stand firm and recall it to mind, you transgressors. Now, I know people don't like to be called transgressors or wretched men. But such we all were. We are sinners saved by the grace of God. Remember from of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done. I'm not simply the God of this age. I'm the God of all ages. I'm the God who has declared all things that will ever be before anything came to be. And exactly as I've declared it will be is exactly how it will be because he is God and no other. And so that we understand something of the scope of that, he simply says it simply like this, declaring the end from the beginning... And from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. That's an astounding thing, isn't it? Wait, from beginning to end, his counsel will stand? From beginning to end, his purposes perfectly, perfectly, completely, absolutely, and totally will be accomplished. There's nothing that falls by the wayside. There's no, oops, I missed that one. There isn't. Absolutely. Well, he can't be talking about everything. I mean, even insignificant things like a bird. Well, let's read verse 11. Calling a bird of prey from the east. Now if a bird of prey, a single bird of prey, comes from the east and eats a single rat walking on the ground, has that changed the trajectory of history? I mean, it, it's, it seems insignificant, right? It, what does that matter? Even the things that seem to be insignificant and matter not and have no human significance or historical bearing, even that is absolutely under God's perfect control and design. Well, yeah, he could tell a bird what to do, but men have free will, do they? God is able to control men as easily as he is able to control a bird or a squirrel or a lion that might be a lion in a lion's den 
or anything else. Remember, we're told in Proverbs 16, 33, what does God do, or Proverbs 21, what does God do with the hearts of kings? He turns them wherever he will. Listen to what it says. And the man of my counsel from a far country. I have spoken. I will bring it to pass. I have purposed. I will do it. Wait a second. That makes it seem like this God is absolutely God in such a way that he does whatever he wants. I mean, it makes me think that there would be the possibility of a man being the most powerful king on the face of the earth who might stand on top of his castle surveying his kingdom and amazed at himself at what might and what skill and what intelligence to accumulate this great kingdom. Maybe his name might even be something such as Nebuchadnezzar. And this man, maybe while in his own boasting, while it is still upon his tongue, might find out what? You think it's within your will? Today or tonight you will eat this in your kitchen? You will sleep in your bed? My friend, you have overestimated your will. Tonight, you will not even have the power to exercise the desire to enter your bedchamber. From now on, your private chamber will be out in the forest. Hopefully you pick up on all those subtleties this man absolutely who had the most power in the world before God was rendered what no different than a beast to whom will you liken God I mean I fear we sometimes liken God to the most powerful among men we are far far missing it again as we go through the scriptures, and I'm going to just, for the sake of brevity, point out a few things here. In Jeremiah chapter 10, the children of Israel are told, learn not the ways of the nations around you. Don't imitate them. It says to them in their confusion and their idols, it explains it in this way. Verse 5 of Jeremiah 10 says, their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field which is, uh, doesn't do anything, does it? It shows their uselessness, and sometimes it's even an uncomfortable language, but it says this in verse 8 of Jeremiah 10. They are both stupid and foolish. The instruction of idols is but wood. See, to be stupid is bad. To be foolish is pretty bad. To be both, oh my, this is the condition. And, and they build up these things. They dress it up. It's the work of skilled man. But by contrast, verse 10 of Jeremiah 10. But the Lord is the true God. The true God. The true God. Only Him. He is the living God. These others, nothing. You could go knock on wood and that's all you've done. Oft times they're hollow these days. I'm shocked because there's one festival in India where they carry these things out, they find a pool of water, and then they throw the little fella in. And he sinks. He doesn't swim, he doesn't do anything, and, and then eventually, months go by, nobody's watching, somebody goes in and digs them all out <laughs> so that it doesn't create some sort of clogging problem or as it uh, falls to pieces makes the water unusable God is the true God he is the living God the everlasting king the everlasting king you know what that means he commands it all everlasting always has is now and always will he's the everlasting king and at his wrath and you say whoa, whoa 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 i was with you when you were saying god was sovereign and i was with you when you were saying god was powerful but why did you have to go to wrath 
go around that and make your way to love. Plenty of people do that, don't they? Brothers and sisters, we will never understand the love of God unless we understand the wrath of God. Because as those who are the objects of God's love in Christ, we are beloved in the beloved because he bore the wrath of God for us. We are accepted in him because he bore our sin in his own body, becoming, in a sense, unacceptable before God and crying out those mysterious words that will always boggle our mind, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus, the beloved one, would know the wrath and anger of God. At his wrath, the earth quakes. I tell you, brothers and sisters, we may live in an age at which, when we proclaim God, the earth mocks. But the time is coming when the earth will quake and the nations cannot endure his indignation. Verse 14 Again, lays it out more uncomfortably. Every man is stupid and without knowledge. You can, hopefully you're picking up why, why I referred to, as, to men as irrational. I'm going to give two more examples before we drive this home. Now, most of our time is spent on this first part today intentionally as we broaden it and lay that foundation. The other are just a few bricks added to the pieces here. But in terms of people thinking all gods are the same, all religions are the same. Do you hear that today? Do people say all religions are the same? They're just different ways to the same God, the same God called by different names. This is utter nonsense. The Philistines in 1 Samuel chapter 5 were under the impression that there was really no difference between their God and the God of Israel. Clearly that was the case because sometimes, and you would see this, enemies would come to battle against Israel and they'd be like, oh no, they defeated us on the plains. Next time we should battle them in the mountains. Maybe our God is stronger in the mountains and their God is stronger on the plains. Is that how it works? That's not how it works, but that's how men's brains work because, quoting the scriptures, stupid without knowledge, foolish. Right? And so, but God in judgment for the wickedness of Israel allowed for the Ark of the Covenant to be taken because he had purposed the death of of Eli's evil sons. These men take the Ark of the Covenant that they understood represented for Israel the presence of God, and as they took it captive, they thought to themselves, well, what do we do with this? Well, we should probably put it in a sacred place next to our God. Anyway, since our God just defeated them and their God. Now that would be a faulty calculation. Why? They had victory because God was bringing Israel to judgment. God in handing over the ark would speak as a great indictment against the children of Israel that they are behaving in a way that they are unworthy of the glorious presence of God. But men misinterpret it. We won. We beat their God. We finally overcame. Dagon did it. That was their God's name. And of course, most of you will be familiar with 1 Samuel chapter 5. If not, I'm going to give you a brief overview of it. They bring him in. They bring the ark and they set it in next to, kind of down as a servant position to Dagon. And here Dagon is there. And they leave for the night. And you know what happens, right? When they come in the morning, Dagon is moved and fallen down prostrate, but prostrate before the Ark of the Covenant. And this is what's shocking is this. In all of the history of that temple, every time they opened that door in the morning, had that big fella moved an inch, <laughs> never a smidge. 
It, no power. Now, someone might be saying, well, maybe if there was an earthquake, a little skidgy. Uh, look, he had not moved then. Circumstances would have shifted him a wee bit. But he was down. So what did they do? Well, they helped their poor God get back up on his feet, placed him back in the position of prominence, so good that they were available to help their God in need. And then what happens the next night? When they come back in the next morning, their God no longer has a head, no longer has hands, no longer has feet. Simply its trunk and torso are now at the foot of the ark and the others are cast at the doorway. He has the eyes but could not see a mouth but could not speak, hands but could not feel, feet but could not walk, and so now he has none of those things. Figure it out! And what's shocking to me is at this point, do you and I not think, Philistines should be saying, I think we ought to switch gods. It's pretty clear this God is more powerful than ours. We're done with headless, handless Dagon out of there they didn't do that they said well we better get rid of this God because he's too mighty for us and you just think what a tragic circumstance befalls now into that I would say this we tend to think this but I don't have an idol in my home I don't practice any form of idolatry to which I'm going to read you a brief passage. Some of you are already guessing where we're going in Colossians because we've been there recently. Colossians 3, 5 to 7 says this. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. Wait a second. You're reading from the New Testament. I always thought the God of the Old Testament was wrath and the God of the New Testament was love. Uh, what you didn't understand is God is God and He changes not. And, the, and He is a God of wrath and love. He is a God of judgment and mercy. And he will have mercy on whom he has mercy. And he will have compassion upon he, whom he has compassion. And oh, that everyone here might be an object of that mercy. But he says this, and covetousness, which is idolatry. I want that. Now, covetousness, it, it's interesting because it's a peculiar word in the Greek. We have a tendency to lock it always into financial things, but it really is way broader than that. It is the theme of I want. That is idolatry. You want to figure out who your God is. What do you want most what motivates you what do you live for what do you pursue more than anything else and you will have found what your God is that is a, a, an idolatry and this is a strong warning Matthew uh, chapter 6 with regard to the Pharisees and their extreme focus on money Jesus says to them no one can serve two masters and that is there whether it is God and money. That is there whether it is God and pleasure. That is it whether it is God and assets or things. Whether it is God and self. Whether it is God and son. God and husband. God and anything. It is idolatry. You cannot serve God and we serve God. We have turned from these vain things to serve the true and living God.
Now, note, in the serving of the true and living God, there are particular things a husband will do towards his wife and son and family. Particular things a, a, a husband will, a, a wife, so on and so forth, back and forth will do, but they do it ultimately in service to God. We're warned further in Psalm 62, verse 10 and 11, put no trust in extortion, Set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Why? Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. That means power belongs to nothing else, no one else. I do remember with great personal confusion uh, in the days of 2008, where there were massive market crashes and things fell apart and people would find themselves in a home that is now sort of, they're owing double what it's valued at and many people committing suicide as a result of the loss of financial circumstances. And it's it's heartbreaking uh, the loss of life and the grief for those left behind, but even worse, How is it that that's what your hope was set on? That's what your life was set on. This is not how we think. This is not how we live. I feel like we struggle because we live in a world like that where idolatry can come, again, rooted in the I want. I want to be seen as this. I want to be recognized as that. But you're not. You were born in a completely different body. That's not what you are. But I want to be seen as that. And that becomes all they live for. And communities gather around and they call themselves some kind of a community. Uh, You know, a a tragic assembly of people who are basically saying, I want. And even they're being trained from day one, not being told this is right, this is wrong, this is who you are, this is how you ought to live. They're being told, what do you want? What do you think about this? You know, my daughter was telling us a joke the other day. She was saying that um, in, in some mockery of the tragedies that are going on in the present world today, that supposedly some family said, we decided to let our kids name themselves. So they didn't have names for the first number of years of their life. And let me introduce you to Spider-Man and Batman. And come on, it just is lunacy, isn't it? But how different is that than the other things that are going on? It is this idea of want, want. My mind goes to Proverbs chapter 30, verse 15, that says this, the leech has two daughters. Give and give. No need to give them separate names because they're all about the exact same thing, what they want want oh first corinthians chapter 10 reminds us of these important words verse 13 and following no temptation has overtaken you it's not common to man god is faithful i always love those insertions of those phrases here i am or you are in the midst of temptation in the midst of trial in the midst of some kind of onslaught or difficulty and and the whole idea isn't i got this i am faithful our focus is first and foremost on our god He is faithful, and in him we will find the strength for faithfulness. In him we will overcome. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So we don't look to ourselves, do we? We look to him. And so uh, what it says here is, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man, and God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Verse 14 says this then, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. It's an important thing. Anything that would be your highest priority, 
anything that is tempted to take your eyes off of Christ who's seated at the right hand of God, anything that, that is pulling you, flee from it and serve the living God. We move on a little further here, and as we've gone from men's irrationality, things don't get better. My second point here is men's ignorance. Verse 21. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? The the piling up of phrases really kind of carries this sense. What's wrong with you? Because you should have heard, you should have known. We've been through this in the past, and for those who haven't been with us long, I'll remind you of this. In the Garden of Gets, or in the Garden of Eden, how many religions were there? How many gods were there? One god was known. One god was worshipped. In the days when Noah brought his family through the flood, coming out of there, how many gods were known and worshipped? One. And so for all of those descendants, fathers should be telling sons, should be telling sons and children, grandparents speaking, there is a God, maker of heaven and earth, delivered our forefather through the flood. His wrath came out against sin, but he is a merciful God who saw fit to deliver us. And he is the God to be served. He is the God to be worshiped. But what did men soon do? And you're aware of what Romans 1 says. They traded the glory of God for the glory of men. They made images to supposedly represent God, even though none of the things they make could possibly have created the heavens and the earth with its greatness and its immensity. And we see the irrationality of this, the ignorance of men. And I give you just one example before we move on to our second main point this morning. This is out of 2 Chronicles 25. In 2 Chronicles 25, there is a king named Amaziah. And Amaziah was uh, in a, under a circumstance where he was preparing to go into battle. He felt like his trained soldiers, the king of Judah, was not enough, his 300,000, so he hired 100,000 Ephraimites to join him. These are not godly people. These are not right people. And so the, the prophet comes in to him and says this, you know, don't bring them with you. Why should you suppose that God will cast you down before the enemy? God has the power to help and the power to cast down. Simply saying this, Amaziah, how dare you think the results have anything to do with how many soldiers you have? You missed it. You should have known this. It depends on God. Had God not delivered the children of Israel sometimes through few? You remember a time where a whole army is gathered together and a few lepers go running out in desperation because they're starving and they're going to beg the enemy for some food. God so stirs up the sound of those few running lepers that the enemy begins to go nuts and kill each other and flee. God doesn't need us. God at times sent hail from heaven that killed more than were killed by the sword. God at other times took groups that had joined together to come against Israel and he said, today the battle belongs to the Lord. You're doing nothing. You get up there and you have a look. And they all just begin to fight against one another until not a one is left. The last two do a mutual plunge and finished. And you think, Wow. But Amaziah, and he's like, but I already paid them. Doesn't matter if you already paid them. So you lose that money, but you win the war. God can give you much more than that. Your focus is all wrong. And I wish that was the worst I had to say about Amaziah in this section. But it says this. They go into the battle Verse 14 to 16 of 2 Chronicles 25. After Amaziah came from striking down the Edomites, he brought the gods of the men of Seir 
and set them up as his gods and worship them. We go in, we defeat them, we take their piddly little gods that we defeated and that didn't protect them, and we take these little beggars back, we set them up, and now we're going to worship these gods. Did he not know God gave him the victory? And then he takes this back and he worships it as their gods. It says, therefore God was very angry with Amaziah and he sent the prophet to him and said, why have you sought the gods of a people who did not deliver his own people from your hands? The God who gave you victory you abandoned for the loser God. What is wrong with you? Well, I'll tell you what's wrong. Men are irrational. Men are ignorant of eternal things and eternal truths apart from the grace of God. If God does not open our hearts and opens our minds, we are going to continue to do the foolishest things. And we're going to think we're wise in our own eyes. But it is hopeless. Let's go on, if we would, to verse 22 to 24. And we move from... uh, incomparability in terms of foolish comparisons to the incomparable immensity and eternity of God. It says this, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Now again, this is not for you to do some sort of calculation and estimate that how much uh, the size of a human to the size of a grasshopper is approximately. No, 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 no. We're not doing that. The sense of it is what? We are small. We are insignificant. He is great. He is mighty. He is powerful. We are like nothing before him. When the children of Israel feared going into the promised land, saying that we are like grasshoppers before them and like bread, they meant we are nothing and powerless. This is the sense that it's saying in a Hebrew poetry. He is immense and eternal, and we are insignificant says this further, who brings the princes, verse 23, to nothing. All right, so generally we're insignificant. The biggest, most powerful, most influential among us, he brings to nothing. He makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. That word, second word for emptiness there simply means insignificant, meaningless, useless, irrational. You know? And some of us, I think, when we look at politics in the world, we're feeling very much the same way. Right? <laughs> this is irrational, this is useless, this is powerless. Thankfully, we know all of history is in God's hands. We put not our trust in men and in their hands. Even as Psalm 146 says, put not your trust in princes or in the son of man in whom there's no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth and his plans perish. But then compares that with God. But blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, all that is in them, and who keeps faith forever the one who sets the prisoners free, who opens the blind eyes, who watches over the sojourners and the fatherless. So in this simple passage, it gives us these, these three ideas, size, not that we would estimate a size of God, because again, part of that I think, it's really to his immeasurable greatness and us diminutive and minuscule him so glorious, us so insignificant. And the, and the picture of that, I, sometimes when someone's getting a calculation crazy, I do remind you, heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. Yes? Well, how high are the heavens? They kept thinking with the launch of the James Webb telescope that they will now see the ends of the universe. They did not find it. So at this point, they, they, the language ends up being this of the visible universe. Approximately, they say, 93 million light years, the visible universe. For former Trekkies, that's 23 parsecs. <laughs> you know, 
but the, 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 the sense of it is, uh, uh, we can't even understand that kind of thing. Travel at the speed of light for 93 million years and you've not reached the edge of the heavens? Uh, you know, and that's his throne? Oh my. How, how immense is God? And then I think how insignificant. This week, I don't know if you saw, someone found a, a remote tribe somewhere in the Amazon and took pictures of them. And if you saw those pictures, you had to really zoom in to get a look at the people because from, the, from whatever that craft was, they looked like ants. They, had been, they were such a small group in just a little clearing in the field that they seemed insignificant and had been overlooked until this point in time. I think, well, the earth, the universe. We're not getting those pictures. The sun. You know how many earths it takes that you could fill into the sun? 330 thousand earths to fill up the sun and the sun is a small star in the cosmos we have stars we know that measure more than a thousand times it i know some of you who don't like astronomy this means nothing to you but it boggles my mind and amazes me the heavens proclaim his handiwork and make known his power and i sit back and it is just awesome and I think that even when we've seen pictures of crafts that we've sent out that turn back around and take a little photograph of the earth do you see Mount Everest or Mount Whitney or any of those things or does it look pretty smooth or if you're not seeing Mount Everest hint I'm smaller than Mount Everest <laughs> if you were on the moon which isn't that far you couldn't see me the mountains are just like a blip. And I'm what? Less than a speck of dust at the foot of the blip. And yet we think the whole world revolves around us. We think that God needs our guidance and our advice. Sometimes we think that God needs us. God does not need anything. He does not need human hands. We are not his counselors. Oh, Lord, help us to understand our insignificance and be amazed that you would make us your possession. Be amazed that you would take note of us. What we would have overlooked as insignificant, you were pleased to set your love upon before the foundation of the world. Oh, to know that. And then there's a, the comparison of the strength the princes are those, the, the word there literally is the weighty or the commanding. And what does he make, what does he cause them to be? Nothing. <laughs> the weighty and the commanding are nothing. They hold no power, they hold no sway, but he holds it all. And then again, it, it unpacks sort of the span of them all. What? They are short like grass, like flower, like stubble, but he is eternal and immense. It's kind of like, all right, I asked you what you will compare God with and you should have said nothing but you still tend to do it. So if you're going to play the comparisons I'm going to try to do the best to give you some glimpse of it. Everything, nothing. Powerful, impotent. Immense, insignificant. Oh my. And then we end even with the utter incomparability further piled up in verse 25 and 26. And he says it again, to whom then will you compare me that I should be like him? Lift up your eyes and see who created these things. And I would hope that you would be able to see that in the sky even tonight, who created these things, who brings out their hosts by number and calls them by name, by his greatness and his might, because his power is strong, not one is missing. This speaks of his precisions. Psalm 145 verse four says, he determines the number of the stars and gives to all of them their name. For centuries, they come up. And it hasn't been centuries, but I can still say this from my astronomy class, 
more than a couple years ago in college to now, I can still look up in the sky and it's the same constellations. It's the same planets that are there. And I think that they have been there since the beginning of days. Such that men can, there's a consistency to the, and precision to the divine order that men can navigate by means of those tools, right? And so it's an amazing thing to see the perfect hand of God, not just randomly creating, but his personal care and precision in all of it, and then further, his great power. Isaiah 40, 25 says, look up at the sky. Who created these heavenly lights? Who's the one who leads them out in their ranks? He calls them by name because of his absolute power and awesome strength, not one is missing. I mean, that's a beautiful picture, isn't it? And I tell you what, that's true of the stars, but when I hear not one is missing, my mind immediately goes to John chapter six. And Jesus says those glorious words, all the Father has given me will come to me and I will not lose any of all that my Father has given me, but raise them up on the last day. Brothers and sisters, as we look at the stars in the sky, as once again they come out and not one is missing, let us rejoice in a greater reality, the promises that are ours in Christ for those who believe. Luke 21 says it this way in verse 33, heaven and earth will pass away, but God's words will never pass away. These things that have seemed permanent will come to an end. But even when all of creation comes to an end and there is a new heaven and new earth, you are still going to find out who is absolutely sovereign and powerful and sustaining it all and accomplishing his will such that not one is lost. Oh, what a great God we have. And so when we see this, it reminds us of this, and here's the overview of what we've looked at today, considering the glorious greatness of God. His utter incomparability. The foolish comparisons that were there with idols and with men and with things of creation. It's just foolish. It's irrational. We ought not fix our hopes or our hearts on these things. Oh, that God would open our hearts and fix them firm upon him. Secondly, this passage reminds us as we have a tendency to elevate others, elevate history, elevate politics, elevate people, elevate ourselves, reminds us of his incomparable immensity and eternity and our insignificance and brevity. He is immeasurable, we are insignificant. He is the ruler, the rulers of this earth to nothing. The span, he is eternal. The things of this earth are gone tomorrow. And then the incomparable of creation and constancy. God's precision and perfect care, specifically in detail, in his handiwork in creation. And I think what a glorious thing to understand that God with that precision, that perfect certainty, is the God not only of creation, he's the God of salvation. And when he has purposed to pull out of the world a people to himself and preserve them till the end, brothers and sisters, it will be. As sure as he is, as sure as he has made known his word, as sure it will be. And in closing, I read from 1 Peter 1, 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power 
are being guarded through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that it puts us in our place. Lord, I pray that a consideration of this would humbly put us in our low place that we would at least to some degree rightly esteem you in your exalted and glorious estate. Lord, we know that in this life we only know in part. But Lord, we pray and we are thankful for your word. May it impress upon us your greatness, your power, our insignificance, the insignificance ultimately of everything in creation, the way that you are sovereign over it and have designed it to accomplish your purposes. Lord, and we thank you for your hand demonstrated throughout creation and then your son sent forth in salvation. Oh, what a glorious promise and what a glorious privilege to be called out and known by name and to be sure that on that last day, None will be missing. Thank you for your great power that caused us to be born again and will keep us for yourself until that day. Hold us fast, O God, and fix us firm upon you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.